Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina, and this is my lecture on family planning. To download my lecture deck for free, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. And this is the reference of my lecture. It's Comprehensive Gynecology, Chapter 13, Family Planning. So when we talk about contraception, whether it be surgical or medical or natural or artificial, we talk about the terms typical use effectiveness and perfect use effectiveness. So how are they different from each other? Typical use effectiveness is the pregnancy rate given the actual use, including occasional inconsistent or incorrect use of the patient. Perfect use effectiveness, on the other hand, is a pregnancy rate given correct and consistent use of a method with every act of intercourse. In other words, perfect use effectiveness is the failure rate when the patient or the couple use the contraceptive method perfectly. Pregnancy rates can vary widely between typical and perfect use depending on how complicated it is to use a method perfectly. So in general, coitus-related methods and more user-dependent methods are less effective than forgettable methods such as the long-acting reversible contraceptive such as the DMPA or the surgical sterilization. Use of two methods or dual method use provides added contraceptive protection. Combining a hormonal method with a condom provides an additional health benefit of reducing sexually trans transmitted infections. Other multipurpose technologies are in development to concurrently prevent unintended pregnancy and reduce the risk of sexually transmitted infection, particularly HIV. So, so in this table, this shows us the summary of the contraceptive efficacy of all the contraceptive methods that are available for women. So if we look at this, so we see the spermicides have a very high or fairly high um, typical use effectiveness or the failure rate with typical use. And there's also a fairly high a failure rate with perfect use. And then compare that, let's say for example, with male sterilization, which has a very low failure rate at 0.15%. Look at um, Implanon has a failure rate of 0.05% for both typical use and perfect use. So again, in this table, this is the WHO Steered Approach Contraception Counseling Tool, which compares typical effectiveness of contraceptive methods. So again, we see here that the least effective would be spermicides, and then the most effective would be the first-year contraceptives such as the implanons, female sterilization, vasectomy, and IUD. So now let's first talk about the tier 1 methods or the methods that are highly effective with fewer than one pregnancy per 100 women in one year. And this includes the IUDs, implants, and male and female sterilization. So the top tier contraceptive methods include all LARC methods or the long-acting reversible contraceptives. These methods require only one act of motivation to enable long-term use, which virtually eliminates user error once placement has occurred. LARC methods are highly effective and immediately reversible with a rapid return to fertility after its removal. Very few medical contraindications to LARC exist. These methods do not require frequent visits for resupply or incur cost after placement, though upfront costs can be very high. When used in the postpartum and post-abortion period, LARC and permanent sterilization reduce the risk of short interval pregnancy significantly when compared to other hormonal methods. All of this contributes to high continuation rates and user satisfaction. As a result, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, or the ACOG, recommends that LARC methods be offered as first-line contraception to most women. The LARC methods currently available here or abroad include a single-rod etanorgestrel subdermal implant, or what we call here in the Philippines as Implanon. In other, in other countries, it is called Nexplanon. There's also the copper 380A intrauterine device and several levonorgestrel intrauterine systems, what we call as Mirena or the LNG-IUS. So first, 
In the LARC methods, we have the intrauterine devices or the IUD. This is a safe and highly effective method of birth control with similar rates of failure for typical or perfect use. The, this is the most commonly used reversible method of contraception worldwide. The first year failure rates with the copper T380A IUD and the levonor just releasing IUD are less than 1%. So that's quite impressive. Correct high fundal insertion lowers the incidence of partial or complete expulsion. Failure rates associated with IUDs are comparable to those achieved with surgical sterilization. So let's talk about the two types of IUDs. So basically, we have the copper T380A IUD or the brand name Paragard, and the other one is the LNG IOS or the levonorgestrel intrauterine system or the brand name Mirena. So first, the Paragard or the copper T380A IUD. Because of the constant dissolution of copper, which on a daily basis amounts to less than that ingested in a normal diet, copper IUDs require periodic replacement, that is every 10 years. So at the scheduled time of removal for women desiring continued contraceptive protection, the device can be removed and another inserted after the same one's visit. So the next type of IUD is the LNG IOS or the levonorgestrel intrauterine system or Mirena. 20 micrograms of levonorgestrel or LNG is released into the endometrial cavity each day using this system. And this system is good for 5 years. And this reduces menstrual blood loss and has been used therapeutically to treat heavy menstrual bleeding. So treating heavy menstrual bleeding is one of the non-contraceptive benefits of Mirena or the LNG IUS. So what is the mechanism of action of IUDs, whether it be the Mirena or the copper IUD? So all, all IUDs induce a local inflammatory reaction of the endometrium, creating an environment that is hostile to the sperm so that fertilization of the ovum does not occur. Please note that the mechanism of action is mostly a local inflammatory reaction and not as a barrier. Although this sterile inflammatory reaction is the only mechanism of inert IUDs, medicated IUDs such as the LNG IUS or Mirena, either copper or levonorgestrel produce additional local effects that increase their efficacy in preventing pregnancy. The copper IUD In the copper IUD, copper markedly increases the extent of the inflammatory reaction, allowing it to accumulate throughout the uterine lumen and penetrate the cervix and probably the fallopian tubes. This affects the function and viability of gametes at many levels, preventing fer fertilization and lowering the chances of development of any zygote that may be formed before it reaches the uterus. And the copper also impedes sperm transport and viability in the cervical mucus. LNG IOS or Mirena, on the other hand, the progestin thickens the cervical mucus because you know that levonorgestrel is a progestin and progestin thickens the cervical mucus, so that impedes the sperm penetration and access to the upper genital tract. And this also decreases tubal motility and also produces a thin inactive endometrium. Remember that the progesterone or progestins have an antiperistaltic action and therefore it can decrease tubal motility. So low levels of circulating steroid hormones inhibit ovulation. So what is the right timing of inserting the IUD? IUD can be safely inserted in any of the following scenarios. First, on any day of the cycle provided the woman is not pregnant. Second, immediately post-abortion or post-curetage. And number three, immediately postpartum following either vaginal or cesarean section delivery. Immediate postpartum insertion carries a higher risk of IUD expulsion, particularly in the case of an LNG IUS following vaginal delivery with expulsion rates of up to 24%. And because of this, you may have the option of inserting IUD six weeks postpartum. The copper IUD can be used as emergency contraception for up to five days following unprotected intercourse. What are some of the adverse effects of IUD in the patient? First is uterine bleeding. 
the patient may experience heavy or prolonged menses or intermenstrual bleeding, and this may be produced by an increased rate of prostaglandin release in the presence of an intrauterine foreign body. Stimulation of uterine contractions by prostaglandins may also possibly prolong the menses of the woman. Bleeding usually diminishes with time as the uterus adjusts to the presence of the foreign body. In contrast, for the Mirena or the LNG IUS, there is usually a 60% reduction in the, the menstrual blood loss during the use of Mirena or LNG IUS. The second possible adverse effect with the use of IUD is perforation, and usually this happens at the fundus area or the fundal area. This is a rare complication but potentially serious. Perforation always begins at the time of insertion. Perforation of the uterus is best prevented by straightening the uterine axis with a tenaculum and then measuring the cavity with the uterine sound before IUD insertion. How about complications related to pregnancy? So a pregnancy with an IUD in place is rare. Among the few IUD users who do become pregnant, however, an extra uterine location is more likely than among pregnant women without an IUD. Now, a pelvic ultrasound must be done to locate the pregnancy in these cases. In the event of an intrauterine pregnancy when an IUD is in place, the IUD should be removed regardless of whether the pregnancy is desired or undesired. If a pregnancy occurs and the IUD is not removed, the incidence of spontaneous abortion is approximately three times greater than would occur in pregnancies without an intrauterine device. How about the presence of infection in a non-pregnant IUD user? The placement process, not the device itself or its thread, creates a transient risk of infection, as does any transcervical procedure. Positive gonorrhea or chlamydia screening tests that occur with an IUD already in place can usually be successfully treated without removing the IUD. Now, for a symptomatic patient continuing an IUD, an antibiotics regimen for PID approved by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or the CDC should be used until the woman becomes symptom-free. However, if the infection does not improve or if there is evidence of tubo ovarian abscess, then the device should be removed. What are the contraindications to IUD? Of course, pregnancy or suspicion of pregnancy. When there's infection such as acute PID or a postpartum endometritis or infected abortion. When there is known or suspected uterine or cervical malignancy. When there's genital bleeding of unknown origin. And when there's a previously inserted IUD that has not been removed. Both copper and levonorgestrel IUDs can and should be offered to young or nulliparous women. The second large contraceptive is the subdermal implant, which contains the, the progestin etonorgestrel. Among the most subdermal implants are among the most effective methods of contraception available with an effectiveness equal or superior to that of sterilization in IUDs. This consists of one or more thin rods containing a progestin hormone, which is etonorgestrel. Insertion is performed in the outpatient setting only, and the entire procedure takes about less than 5 minutes. After skin infiltration with local anesthesia, the implant is inserted superficially into the subcutaneous tissue of the upper arm using a trocar. Insertion site is closed with adhesive without the need for suturing. When the implant is inserted in any area of the subcutaneous tissue, the steroid diffuses into the circulation at a relatively constant rate. Superficial insertion enhances the ease of removal, and deeply implanted implants are more difficult to remove and therefore more painful for the patient. The implant can be inserted on any day during a woman's cycle provided she is not pregnant. Ovulation inhibition is the main mechanism of action of this implant, and thickening of the cervical mucus also can occur. Ovulation is completely inhibited for at least 30 months after insertion. Following removal of the implant, serum etonorgestrel levels decline rapidly and are undetectable within one week after removal. So, ovulation resumes rapidly post-removal. So, 
Another one of the tier 1 contraceptive methods would be the permanent contraception, whether it be female or male sterilization. So first, let's tackle male sterilization. Male ster so male sterilization or vasectomy is a safe and highly effective outpatient procedure that takes about 20 minutes to finish and requires only local anesthesia. The vast deference in this procedure is isolated and cut. And the ends of the vas are closed or stitched or sutured either by ligation or by fulguration and then replaced in the scrotal sac. This occlusion of the vas prohibits sperm from passing into the ejaculate. The ejaculate is therefore sperm-free but otherwise unchanged. However, with this procedure, you must always warn your patient that post-vasectomy is not immediately sterile. So about 13 to 20 ejaculations must occur after the operation or the vasectomy before the ejaculate will be sterile. The absence of sperm is confirmed with a semen sample and until that time, another method of birth control may be used. For the female sterilization, this is the sterilization for women that blocks fertilization by cutting or occluding the fallopian tubes and preventing the union of the sperm in the egg. And this is highly effective. So there are different several methods for female sterilization that we can offer our patient. So we can do this either laparoscopically or through explore lab or a mini lab or we can do it also by hysteroscopy. So if we choose to do a bilateral tubal ligation by lab or EL, we can do a modified Pomeroy technique such as seen here in the right, in the right side of the slide. We can also place a falloprin or a silastic band or a filchie clip. However, we can also do it uh, hysteroscopically by inserting an assure ring through the tubal ostia of the uterus. So now let's discuss the tier 2 methods. These are methods that are very effective with only 6 to 12 pregnancies per 100 women in one year. And the tier 2 methods include the injectables, the pills, the patch, and the ring. So let's first talk about the injectables. So in this case, we have the injectable suspension in the form of depomedroxyprogesterone acetate or the DMPA. Medroxyprogesterone acetate is a 17-acetoxy-6-methyl derivative of progesterone that has increased proge progestogenic potency and is longer acting. DMPA or the Depo-Medroxyprogesterone Acetate is the long-acting injectable formulation of MPA and this consists of a crystalline suspension of MPA. DMPA is extremely effective contraceptive and involves the three mechanisms of action. First, it inhibits ovulation by suppressing levels of FSH and LH and eliminates the LH surge. Number two, it thickens the cervical mucus, thereby inhibiting the sperm from reaching the oviduct. And number three, it alters the endometrium, which causes it to atrophy. When used correctly and consistently, the chance of pregnancy is just 0.2%. Typical failure rates are around 6%. So these are the dosages of the MPA. We can give it at 150 milligrams IM, that's an injection deep into the gluteal or deltoid muscle. And the other dose is 104 milligrams subcutaneous injection injected into the subcutaneous tissue of the anterior thigh or abdominal wall. Medroxyprogesterone acetate or MPA can be detected into the systemic circulation within 30 minutes after its IM injection. As for the return of fertility, the resumption of ovulation is delayed for an average of 6 months to 1 year after a medical injection, and the median delay to conception is about 9 to 10 months after the last injection. As for the return to fertility, the resumption of ovulation is delayed on an average of about 6 months to a year after a single injection, and the median delay to conception is about 9 to 10 months after the last injection. So what are some of the side effects for the MPA? First and the most common is the bleeding pattern or the change in the bleeding pattern of the patient. So in the first three months after the first injection, about 30% of women experience amenorrhea and another 30% to 40% have irregular bleeding or spotting. And, but the spotting or the bleeding is usually light and the bleeding does not cause anemia. 
So as the duration of therapy increases, the incidence of frequent bleeding steadily declines and the incidence of amenorrhea increases. Other side effects include weight changes, headache, and bone loss. And that's the reason why we usually recommend calcium supplements for patients that are on DMPA. Next are the oral contraceptives. Because of their effectiveness and ease of administration, oral contraceptives or OCs became the most widely used method of reversible contraception. All the formulations marketed after 1975 contain less than 50 micrograms of ethinyl estradiol and 3 milligrams or less of one of the several progestines. The most the widely most used methods combine ethinyl estradiol or EE with one of the several synthetic progestines such as cyproterone acetate or levonorgestrel. The major effect of the progestin component is to inhibit ovulation, but progestins also contribute other contraceptive actions such as thickening of the cervical mucus and thinning of the endometrium. The major effects of the estrogen are to maintain the endometrium and thus prevent unscheduled bleeding as well as to inhibit follicular development through a synergistic effect with the progestin. There are three major types of oral contraceptive formulations and this include the daily progestone progestin-only pills, known also as the mini-pill, the fixed-dose monophasic combination pills, and the multiphasic combination pills, or the pills that contain several different doses or several different dose combinations, be it biphasic, triphasic, or four-phasic. But because of the ease of administration of the monophasic, it's the monophasic combination pills that are most uh, readily available in the, in the market today. Many combination OC formulations provide active pills continuously for 21 days, followed by a 7-day hormone-free interval. Most products are packaged with inactive spacer or the placebo pills during the HFI or the hormone-free interval to improve compliance. Oral contraceptives have a 1% failure rate with perfect use and an 8% failure rate with typical use. Accidental pregnancies occurring during OC use probably do not occur because of missing just one or two pills, but rather because the initiation of the new cycle of medication is delayed for a few days or because a greater number of tablets are missed. Women should be advi advised that the most important pill to remember is the first pill of each cycle. So what is the mechanism of action of the OCs or the oral contraceptives? Combination oral contraceptives suppress the gonadotropins. The estrogen component prevents a rise in the FSH and enhances the effect of the progestin component, which inhibits ovulation and LH surge. Changes in the cervical mucus, which prevent the sperm transport into the uterus, the fallopian tube, which interferes with gamete transport, and the intermetrium, which reduces the likelihood of implantation, represent secondary contraceptive effects of the progestin component. So the contraceptive steroids prevent ovulation mainly by interfering with the release of gonadotropin-releasing hormone from the hypothalamus. Bleeding that users of combined OCs experience during the hormone-free interval is what we call withdrawal bleeding. In other words, when there is already menses after stopping the oral contraceptives, that's what, that's what you call withdrawal bleeding. However, the bleeding that occurs during the time that active pills are ingested is called breakthrough bleeding. In other words, this is the bleeding that happens during the course of intake of the oral contraceptive pills. Unscheduled or breakthrough bleeding and absence of withdrawal bleeding occur as a result of insufficient estrogen to support the endometrium. How about the metabolic effects of oral contraceptives? Most frequent symptoms produced by the estrogen component include nausea, breast tenderness, and headache. And the reduction of the EE dose to below 50 micrograms has greatly reduced the incidence of all these estrogenic side effects. And that's the reason why, after the year 1975, you don't see any more the oral contraceptive formulation with the 50 micrograms or more of EE. It's always uh, less than the 50 micrograms. It's, usually, it's in the 35 microgram or less uh, dosage for ethinyl estradiol component. The OCs decrease androgen levels which tend to reduce acne. Weight gain represents a common complaint among women using hormonal contraception, especially those taking oral contraceptives 
with the progestin component of uh, levonorgestrel. Contraceptive skin patch is another tier 2 method. So contraceptive skin patch, which is also called orthoavra, contains 75 micrograms ethinyl estradiol and 6 milligrams of norelgestramine. One patch is applied to the skin each week for three consecutive weeks and no patch for the following week of a four-week cycle to allow withdrawal bleeding. The patch may be applied to one of four anatomic sites, can be the buttocks, upper, upper outer arm, the lower abdomen, or upper torso excluding the breast. Like OC, like OCs, the primary mechanism of action is the inhibition of gonadotropin release and prevention of ovulation. Contraceptive effectiveness and metabolic and clinical effects, including irregular bleeding, are similar to combination oral contraceptives. So next is the contraceptive vaginal ring. You know that basically the vagina is a very vascular organ. So steroids pass easily through the vaginal epithelium directly into the circulation. Now this flexible ring-shaped device contains 2.7 mg of EE and 11.7 mg of etonorgestrel. The contraceptive ring, which we also call in the market as Nuva ring, is placed in the vagina for 21 days and then removed for up to 7 days to allow withdrawal bleeding. Like oral contraceptives, the main mechanism of action is inhibition of gonadotropins and prevention of ovulation. So lastly, we have the tier 3 methods. These methods are effective with a failure rate of 18 or more pregnancies per 100 women in one year. This includes the barrier methods and the fertility awareness-based methods such as lactational amenorrhea, periodic abstinence, and the coitus-related methods. First, we talk about the barrier methods. One example is the diaphragm and the cervical cap. Diaphragm is a thin dome-shaped membrane of latex rubber or silicone with a flexible spring modeled into the rim. This spring allows the device to be collapsed for insertion and then allows for expansion within the vagina to sit the rim against the vaginal wall, creating a mechanical barrier between the vagina and the cervix. A cervical cup, on the other hand, is a cup-shaped silicon or rubber device that fits around the cervix, and this should be fitted to the cervix by a clinician. The diaphragm and the cervical cap should be used with a spermicide and be left in place for at least 8 hours after the last coital act. Failure rate during the first year of use for the diaphragm ranges from 13% to 17% among all users and may be as low as 4% to 8% with perfect use. Another, Another barrier method is the male condom, and this is made up of latex and polyurethane. And this is the only method with FDA-approved labeling that supports the use of the product to prevent both pregnancy and transmission of STIs, or sexually transmitted infections. Condoms should be applied to the erect penis before any contact with the vagina or vulva. The tip should extend beyond the end of the penis by about half an inch to collect the ejaculate. And typical use failure rate is about 15%, which is, well, quite high as compared to the first and second year methods. Another barrier method is the female condom, and this consists of a soft, loose-fitting polyurethane sheath with two flexible rings on both ends. One ring lies at the closed end of the sheath and serves as an insertion mechanism and, and internal anchor for the condom inside the vagina. And the outer ring forms the external edge of the device and remains outside the vagina after insertion, thus providing protection to the introitus and the base of the penis during intercourse. This is inserted prior to the onset of sexual activity and left in place after ejaculation has occurred. The typical use failure rate at one year is, is estimated to be around 21%. That's quite high. So another one of those third-year methods include fertility awareness-based methods. And this includes the LAM or the lactational amenorrhea method. And the basis of this method is because prolactin inhibits gonadotropin pulsatility. In nursing women, we know that prolactin is very high. We call that physiologic hyperprolactinemia. And so these nursing women typically remain amenorrheic for a variable length of time after giving birth. 
Now, the criteria for successful use of LAM are the following. First, the woman or the nursing woman should be exclusively breastfeeding, meaning no supplements for up to six months after delivery. The infant should be less than six months, and the woman should be amenorrheic. Now, lactation amenorrhea has a failure rate of less than 2% when used correctly. Another fertility awareness-based method is the periodic abstinence methods, and we have several methods under this. First is the calendar rhythm method. This is the period of abstinence determined by calculating the length of the individual woman's previous menstrual cycle and makes three assumptions. First, the human ovum can be fertilized for only about 24 hours after ovulation. Sperm can fertilize for three to five days after coitus and ovulation usually occurs 12 to 16 days before the onset of menses. And the fertile period is calculated as the shortest cycle minus 18 days, longest cycle minus 11 days. So for example, let's say a woman has a longest cycle of 35 days and the shortest cycle of that woman is about 26 days. So her fertile period would be, that's longest minus 11, that's 35 minus 11 is 24, and then the shortest cycle is 26, so 26 minus 18 is 6. So meaning her fertile period would be from day 6 to 24. So you avoid intercourse during those days. Another periodic abstinence method is the basal body temperature, wherein the woman must abstain from intercourse from the cessation of menses until the third consecutive day of elevated basal temperature or when she is post ovulatory so in this case so in this method you have to instruct your patient or the woman to plot her temperature or her basal body temperature every day so she knows how to estimate her fertile days or fertile period Another is the cervical mucus method. So intercourse can occur after menses ends until the first day that copious slippery mucus is observed to be present and again four days after the last day when the characteristic mucus was present. <clears throat> so in other, words, in other words, as seen in the picture in the right bottom corner of this slide, the woman is infertile if her cervical discharge looks like this, such as a creamy, thick, lotion-like, or a sticky scant cervical discharge. On the other hand, she is considered fertile when her cervical discharge is wet, watery, or egg white in consistency. Another method is the symptothermal method, which is a combination of a calendar, temperature, and cervical mucus methods. The coitus-related methods include spermicides and the coitus interruptus or withdrawal method. For spermicides, the active agent is a surfactant that immobilizes or kills sperms on contact by destroying the sperm cell membrane. Spermicides must be placed into the vagina before each coital act, often in combination with a barrier contraceptive to increase effectiveness. And the spermicide that is usually used is called the noxinol-9 spermicide. And finally, for the withdrawal method or the coitus interruptus, this is the removal of the penis from the vagina prior to ejaculation to prevent pregnancy. But this can fail or this, is a, this has a very high failure rate because of the small numbers of sperm that are present in the pre-ejaculate. That's it for my lecture. And please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel, Ina Irabon, and my WordPress site, Doc Ina Omegaina. Thank you!